Hi, I'm Robert Owen, Chief Architect of Hybrid IT Solutions for CDI. Thanks for taking your time to meet with us today. We're going to talk a little bit about the hyperconverged space and try to make some sense of the hyperconfusion that exists in the marketplace today. As I'm sure you've all seen in the last six months, we've seen a lot of players enter this market space that was pretty locked down by two significant players before that, which we believe gives a true validation to the marketplace. So what is hyperconverged and why should you care about it? Hyperconverged infrastructure is the data center architecture that embraces cloud principles and economics. So what that means is we're going to bring simplicity, agility, and efficiency into the data center without creating a lot of complexity. In order to be a hyperconverged system, you need to be based on software, okay? And we're going to talk a little bit about three acts in this solution or solutions that really will define the future of what hyperconverge means. So, as we consolidate things like compute, storage, network, hypervisor, and data protection, it really becomes important that we're able to bring enterprise functionality on x86 commodity building blocks. So, as this market is validated, hardware decisions will definitely impact software choices, right? So the hardware or why hardware matters to the success of your software-defined storage deployment is based on whether you choose one of two things, right? We can either go down the road of a pre-integrated appliance or a hardware neutral offering based on reference architecture. So we'll see that kind of evolve as we go through this when we talk about either consuming hardware or consuming software that you can choose your own hardware on, right? And that becomes important to the level of integration and almost the level of science project that you're gonna create for yourself. So with rapid deployment comes predictable results. We've seen this evolve through three distinct phases in, in, in our market. And the first one is the traditional one that we're all used to, right? Where we go out and we choose storage, we choose servers, we choose networking, we choose all the software to wrap around it, we architect, plan, procure, set up, provision, test, and deploy that. And in a best case scenario, that takes three months from the time we decide what we actually want to do to the time that we're deploying production workloads on that system. So time is lost, right? We lose time in architecture, testing, deployment phases, and there's multiple vendors generally associated with this. So we have multiple vendor support to deal with in a, in a production system. As we shift into this, the second set of solutions, which have been very popular over the last few years, you know, call it four or five years now, uh, the converged marketplace, where we have pre-tested and designed solutions that come from the factory ready to roll, ready to deploy. Um, once, once they kind of hit the loading dock, you're able to deploy VMs within a few days. We've seen a bunch of these steps kind of removed, which reduces the time from three months down to 45 days. So you have faster deployment, Typically, you have single line of support, right? And you have less silos of management. This created a lot of challenges in the enterprise space because they were all designed from a support perspective for the traditional model. So you had server engineers who only worked on servers, networking engineers who only worked on network, storage guys who only knew storage, and that really doesn't work in the converged space. When you get in the converged space, the converged system becomes an appliance or should become an appliance. Uh, uh, this is the beginning of the private cloud, right? Now, the, in the newest phase or third phase or third act of this hardware deployment, we see hyperconverged, which is based around software definition, okay? Making things invisible like storage to the end user or not even to the end user, to the support personnel. So what we see is even less steps that are required in deploying the solution and a much faster time to market. So we get back to that cloud-like deployments with really good economics. The market as we see it today is, is pretty interesting. So we look at kind of the three big players in, in this space or what's looked at by the, the analysts. We have the converged infrastructure market, which includes the converged and hyper-converged market to some degree, but we're seeing that break out, as you see further down. Um, that converged space is about a $5 billion business with 30%
compound annual growth rate, which is CAGR, right? You'll hear people say that word CAGR when they talk about growth in these markets. The all flash appliance market is about $3 billion. So we have a, le a smaller market, but with a 50% CAGR, which is a higher or faster growing market. And the fastest growing product in that is the VCEV block, which a lot of people are, are running today in the enterprise space. In the hyper-converged market, we see a smaller market again with one and a half to two billion dollars conservatively with a much higher CAGR at 70%. So as you go down this stack, you see bigger market, lower CAGR going to smaller market with higher CAGR. So this is why we're seeing this rapid adoption of this as a, as a concept. Um, players like EMC, VCE, SimpliVity, Cisco, VMware jumping in the market and quite honestly validating it and saying that, hey, this is not going anywhere and this is going to grow drastically. So you can see from the 2015 numbers that we've gathered through public and our own research into these companies that each one of these companies has a different level of revenue that should be considered when you consider these solutions. Some of the main considerations that we just started talking about in hyperconverged systems is what is the market share and what is the viability of these companies, right? So you have the Gartner Magic Quadrant up on the upper right hand side of the screen, right? Kind of places everybody where Gartner believes they are from a visionary perspective um, and allows them to us to see kind of where we are today from a snapshot perspective. So. As that relates back to you as a potential client, what you know, what are the things that matter? Do you you should care about the support structure? So, who's going to support the hardware and software as after you do the initial deployment? Is the hardware and software proprietary? Is it something that can be co-mixed with other solutions as you go forward, right? So, if the viability comes into question of who you've chosen, do you have flexibility in able, being able to shift into another solution without having a very disruptive problem on your hands? Um, are things like backup and data protection important? Are they built in? Are they proprietary? Can you bring your own stuff with you that you already own and use in your existing deployments? Uh, same is true for replication, right? When we talk about disaster recovery, business continuance, high availability, wh what's available today and what is the vision for the cloud going forward? Some of the buzzwords that we've heard over and over again that people seem to be very hot on today are deduplication, compression, and snapshots, right? Leveraging software and metadata in order to make better use of storage, right? And if we look at this kind of first act of hyperconverged solutions being software definition of storage, um, that's when these things become really important, right? We really do care about how well deduplication and compression and snapshots work because this drives efficiency into the software-defined storage that we're so reliant on. Um, last but not least, the real importance here is how do you manage these solutions? Is it, is it integrated with things you already have today? Are there APIs you can leverage? What does the monitoring look like? From a physical perspective, there are some considerations for hyperconverge as well, mostly around the physical connectivity and space requirements. So traditionally, hyperconverged solutions have been leveraged for two distinct use cases, one being remote office, back office, and the other being VDI. Um, some of the challenges we've seen early on are around 10 gig connectivity. Most of these physical appliances require 10 gig connections, and we found that most remote offices don't have 10 gig infrastructure. So it's something to consider as you look start looking at these solutions is will your existing infrastructure actually support deploying these okay some of the other things we talk about are replication bandwidth needs can we actually replicate the data back from these remote offices to a main dc some of the solutions have better offerings than others in terms of what they're sending over the wire in terms of replication when we look at the value of hci and and its density we can see tremendous reductions in power, space, and cooling associated with doing uh, workload deployments, right? Because these systems are so converged and we have so many less components, we're able to get a much denser solution than we ever were before, even with converged solutions. Um, some of the solutions around replication and backups are very simple and integrated, and some others require you bring some other things to the table. 
Uh, last but not least, we talk about scale and how important it is for the solution to grow. Is it going to be a very small solution that never grows or is it something that we're looking at growing into a very large solution, right? Some of these solutions we're gonna talk about in a second do a very good job of scaling massively and some do not. So when we take a look at the HCI landscape, we have two distinct categories that we're talking about. On the left-hand side, at the top, you can see it says software defined, okay? Now we've talked about how software definition of storage is kind of ubiquitous across the landscape, but on the left-hand side, these solutions are truly hardware agnostic. On the right-hand side, we have HCI appliances. So these are your pre-tested, pre-configured solutions that require that you use the same hardware as you grow the solution, okay? So what this means to you from left to right is whether you are more interested in building and operating or creating more of a science project for yourself or you're more interested in buying and consuming something kind of like the Apple experience, right? Where we buy a hardware solution that we know is just going to work, okay? In this slide, we also have tried to consolidate a lot of the pros and cons that we're gonna get into as we break down each one of these individually. And the other thing that you may notice is that because the market is evolving so fast and players are jumping in the market at such a high rate, we don't have every single player that's available in the market. We believe that these six are the ones that most people will be focused on in the near term. And if that changes, we'd obviously add or subtract players as it makes sense. So the first one on the list from the software defined section is Scale.io. Scale.io is truly an enterprise grade software-based solution, okay? EMC has, and with in conjunction with VCE, has uh, hardware platforms that they can define this on uh, through what they call VX Rack. But from a hardware perspective, it truly is agnostic, okay? It's either hyper-converged solution or it can be storage only. So when we talk about software-defined storage, this, this guy really is truly that player, right? Uh, scalability is to thousands of nodes and massive IO parallelism. So when you're talking about scale and multi-tenant capabilities, Scale.io is one of the only players in, in this market that can scale to the size that they can, which is also probably a con for them. So because it's enterprise really only sizing, the kind of getting into the normal use cases around HCI when we talk about remote office or VDI, it becomes cost prohibitive because you need to start so large with this. So we're, we believe that this will become much more of a interesting player in the market as it evolves into what people are calling platform three or web-based applications or, or cloud scale on-prem. So that's really where these guys will play. On the lower end of the software-defined solution, we have vSAN, right? And I say lower end very cautiously. So vSAN scales to 64 nodes. And what's really interesting about it is that it is a little bit different than a lot of the other players in the market because it doesn't require a VSA or virtual storage appliance uh, in the data path. It runs in the vSphere kernel and leverages existing stuff that most of you already have, right? So VMware vSphere is the most highly deployed hypervisor in the market today, and this literally plugs right into it. So if you've got an ELA and you're running vSphere already, this is a very simple way to get into hyperconverged solutions. It also has some unique features around uh, quality of surface. So you can control, limit, and monitor the IOPS for each virtual machine. It has built-in data services around dedupe compression, backup. Um, you can do things like metro cluster, erasure encoding, IO parallelism at a smaller scale than, than what we saw before. Um, some of the cons are that you're bound to VMware licensing. So as the market shifts into what we'll call the second act of making the hypervisor invisible, this may be cumbersome to some people, right? You're, you're, you are bound to that one hypervisor. You're never going to be able to run vSAN in someone else's hypervisor. Um, but we do believe that they'll be fine as it shifts into the third act, which is really truly being integrated with cloud providers. V VMware will consistently 
grow into the cloud space, offering different ways to get in and out of, of the cloud seamlessly. They're also truly hardware agnostic. So because it's truly software defined storage, you can mix and match node types. You can pick, one day you can pick a hardware vendor and if you become disenchanted with that hardware vendor or you get better pricing from another hardware vendor, it doesn't matter. You can mix and match nodes within the same cluster. Now we're gonna shift a little bit into the HCI appliance based models. Nutanix is the first on our list. They were founded in 2009 and were the first to market. So this means they've been shipping product for four years and have 52% market share. They are a household name at this point. When people talk about hyperconverged, people know the name Nutanix. Um, their scalability is interesting. It's along the same lines with VMware if you're using that as your hypervisor. But what's really interesting is that they're kind of shifting into the second act already and allowing you to use different hypervisors. They have their own KVM variant called Acropolis. And there's a tremendous amount of R&D being put into that hypervisor as they believe that people want choice in this space. Um, they also have developed their own management interface called Prism, which is very simple to use. It provides a lot of operational insight into planning and reporting and allows you to truly manage the stack under one pane of glass. You can do upgrades, patching, and management straight from it. Nutanix has relied heavily on what they call data locality, which they say gives predictable performance and supports all the features of VMware that you know and love today. Um, it also has a con in the sense that because your data all now is being served from one node with parity being spread across the cluster, it doesn't allow for nodes to spread out the workload. So all the other players in the market today, specifically around like vSAN, will, will say that data locality is a hindrance, whereas Nutanix say that it is a advantage. Um, the advantage specifically being as they shift into the third act and have the ability to move to and from the cloud, data locality is going to give them what they're, they're calling a storage fabric and uh, allow them to move workloads easier in and out of the cloud. One of the other small cons associated with Nutanix is that you are required to use Prism to manage the solution on top of VMware vCenter management. So there's no single pane of glass for the entire stack um, like there would be in some of the other solutions where you're just leveraging what you know and have already deployed. It's a new software for the, so the support organization to kind of learn. Next we have VxRail. VxRail is VCE and EMC's joint venture into the marketplace leveraging vSAN as the back-end software-defined storage. So this is the what we'll call the Apple-like experience for vSAN. So as you probably know, EMC owns a majority share of VMware and have very tight integration between their engineering teams. So they're literally sitting next to each other in the same building in up in Hockington, Massachusetts, where they are developing the hardware to work with the software. So if you want to procure a hardware appliance that you know is just going to work with your VMware and v vSAN deployment, this is probably the choice that you'll make. Um, the kind of the con for EMC here is that and VCE is this is really their second attempt um, they were part of the Evo Rail program that VMware had initially deployed early last year that really never got off the ground. Um, it's since been kind of done away with. So this is really V2 of the product, which can be seen as a pro or a con. They are a little bit behind in terms of the hardware choice that's available today, but as we've seen with most of the players in this space, that's gonna quickly change as the market evolves over the next six to 12 months. The nice part about VxRail is that you have a single phone number support that is tied directly to back to the software manufacturer. SimpliVity, so SimpliVity was second to market, um, really only faced Nutanix in the beginning of their last two years of deploying hardware and software. And it was a really big play for kind of the SMB and remote office space. They, they positioned themselves almost as the low cost leader. 
and really focused on smaller scale deployments and being lower cost. What's nice about SimpliVity is that it does integrate directly with VMware vCenter for management, so you have your single pane of glass. Um, and it also leverages a hardware card called an Omni Stack card on the back end to do a lot of the offload operations. This can be considered a little bit like a GPU offload card or a graphics accelerator that sits on the PCIe bus and does a lot of the services that tend to take up a lot of resources on the host. Um, it also gives them the ability to do things like global dedupe and compression across clusters. So that's very nice for remote offices when you're replicating them back to a centralized DC because you're able to replicate only deduplicated and compressed data versus trying to send everything over the wire. So lower bandwidth needs for the solution. You can also add SimpliVity directly into existing UCS deployments through their OEM line with Cisco, or you can buy hardware from Lenovo as well. Some of the kind of cons associated with SimpliVity are around the scalability today is only eight nodes. Um, that's gonna change very, very shortly. They're claiming that that's going to at least double in the next release of code. Um, and also, they require a separate Arbiter or vCenter server for their smaller deployments. So you can deploy SimpliVity in a very small two-node deployment, but it does require that you have vCenter kind of running somewhere else so that they can arbitrate split brain syndrome and things like that. Last on the list, we have Cisco's Hyperflex. They were the last to get into the market at the time that this was this information was put together. Um, what's very nice about this solution is that they're leveraging the Unified Computing Systems or UCS hardware virtualization. So they've integrated with the Fabric Interconnect solution that comes with UCS that has integrated top of rack switching. So we're not too worried about how many 10 gig ports we have in a, in a, in a solution or in a site before we deploy this solution. Um, it's really nice that you can scale compute and storage independently with different rack mount or blade offerings. And they've also leveraged a partnership that they have with a company called SpringPath Software. So SpringPath Software is doing all of the data services on the background around inline dedupe and compression. They're saying that in the very near future, they're going to offer containers bare metal and HDFS solutions within the same stack. This is going to really kind of catapult them into the second act of making the hypervisor invisible to the end user and provide options. Day one, they have limited hardware offerings. Again, this is all evolving so quickly right now and everyone's kind of in the same space. The market's demanding all flash offerings. Not everybody has them day one, but I think by the end of the year, this year, we'll see that that changes pretty drastically. And then last but not least is you have the relationship with SpringPath. Cisco did not buy SpringPath. They are in an exclusive relationship with them. So we're hoping that that becomes a very solid and long-term relationship, but there is some concern there. Last but not least, you have the day one, they do require separate fabric interconnects, but again, we've been told that'll change very, very soon, and you'll be able to integrate with existing solutions, which will make this a very attractive offering for people that have heavily invested in UCS to begin with. Thanks again for listening. I'm Robert Owen, Chief Architect of Hybrid IT Solutions for CDI. As you make this journey into the hyper-converged market, please reach out. We'd love to talk to you more about this ever-changing landscape.